أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألهاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علما يقين لترون الجحيم ثم لترونها عين اليقين ثم لتسألن يومئذ عن النعيم رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني أفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى I'd like to begin our درس of سورة التكاثر with a quote a statement from البقاعي رحمه الله he says ولما أثبت في القارعة أمر الساعة وقسم الناس فيها إلى شقي وسعيد وختم بالشقي افتتح هذه بعلة الشقاوة What he says is when Allah Azza wa Jal in the previous surah concluded and established the matter of the hour when he talked about Al-Qari'ah one of the specific features of the last day that knocking sound he ended that surah with a mention of people that will end up in hellfire So we read وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ نَارٌ the people who end up in the hellfire. He says, because he concluded, and as he concluded there with the people of hellfire, he begins this surah, iftataha hadihi. So he, he opened this surah with the reason of ending in hellfire. So the previous surah ended about a certain people that are ending in hellfire, and this one opens with a description of what is it that led them to that hellfire. And in the, in the previous surah, Allah Azza wa Jalla was talking about them. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ Whoever scales became light. But the person was third person, his scales. Not your scales, but his scales. But this surah begins in the second person. It is as though Allah is offering one final advice to these people. And instead of, not talk, instead of talking about them, He is now talking to them. أَلْهَاكُمْ It deluded you. Something deceived you. Something distracted you. And we'll get more into that when we get into the surah further. Just some other points about the nazm, the coherence and the placement of the surah. We talked about a quartet of surahs, four surahs that are kind of bunched together in this series of surahs that we are studying. We had surah al-zilzal, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا It was describing the last day, the zalzala, the, the uh, earthquake of the last day. And then the very next surah started talking about, even though there is that day coming, what people are behaving like nowadays. So it took, went from the future to the immediate present. In al insana li rabbihi lakanud. This is Surah Al-Adiyat. It came to the reality of our time right now. Even though that huge calamity is on its way, people aren't ready. Look at their attitude now. Then again, we went to the Akhirah, Surah Al-Qari'ah, the next Surah. Al-Qari'ah, tum Al-Qari'ah, wa ma adraka man Qari'ah. Yawm yakoonu al-nas kal farash al-mabthuth. That Surah again took us to the last day, and now again we're coming back to a Surah that brings to the brings to mind the reality as it is. Right now. So there was Akhira, Dunya. Then Akhira, then again, Dunya. There's the sequence that's taking place in these surahs. Because of that sequencing, not only does this surah have a relationship with the surah that preceded it, which we just established, the previous one ended with the people of hellfire, and this one is talking about how they, why did they end up here? Not only does it have a relationship with that, it has a relationship also with Surah Al-Adiyat. Because remember the sequences is Surah Al-Akhirah and Surah about Dunya, then a Surah about Akhirah and then a Surah about Dunya. So Al-Adiyat and this Surah, the one we're studying now, at takathur both have to do with what? They both have to do with Dunya. So they have some relationship between them, they have some parallels between them. And as we go further, inshaAllah ta'ala, we will explore these parallels. Let's begin bi idnillah. Just a few words in the first ayah, Al-Hakum takathur Alha in Arabic is a past tense verb. Ilha comes from lahun. Lahu is the trilateral form. The, the thulathi mazid form is ilha. That's the mustar. So alha yulhi ilha. But the original word is lahu. Lam, ha, and wow. Which actually literally means entertainment. It literally means entertainment. 
In another place, Allah Azza wa Jal says, "Ilamu annamal hayatu dunya laibun wa lahun." Know that worldly life is nothing more than play and entertainment. So this is one word, one way that word lahu is understood. Another way the word lahu is understood is that which keeps you busy and takes you away from something you're actually supposed to be doing. And that's exactly what entertainment is. Entertainment essentially is a waste of time. And you could be using that time for something more productive, but you basically lost that time entertaining yourself. That's the essence of the word lahu. But from it, when you come to the word ilha, it means to be distracted, to be pulled away from something. And in the verb itself is already embedded the idea that the thing that distracted you was less important, and the thing you were distracted away from was more important. That was more, that's already embedded in the word itself. Now, similarly, it's used in many places in the Quran. For instance, in Surah Al-Munafiqoon, Allah warns us, "Ya ayuha ladina amanu la tulhikum." Same verb. This is over there. It's in fi'l nahi. This is in the present tense form. لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادكم عن ذكر الله. Don't allow your money and your children to be to to dis, to delude you, to distract you from the remembrance of Allah. So Allah is teach, establishing a point there. When it comes to remembering Allah, then even your money and your children are less important, and they are actually distractions from remembering Allah. Actually, our money and our children should be a means by which we should remember Allah, and that lesson we will learn in this surah. How do you take what you have and that becomes a means not to forget Allah, but a means to remember Allah? That's the lesson essentially in this surah. So it's, the surah begins with a complaint about us being, you know, distracted, us losing our, the sight of things, and it concludes with a lesson that will teach us. It will teach us a profound lesson. The very things that distract us are supposed to be the things that remind us. They're supposed to be reminders. So it's a rewiring of our attitudes that's going to take place in this surah. So al-hakum, it deluded you. I'm saying it as the subject. It deluded you. What is that it? What's the subject of the verb? What is the fa'il? It's at-takathur. At-takathur is the next word in the ayah. So Allah is not saying it deluded you. He is saying at-takathur, which I'm not translating yet, deluded you. It distracted you. The word takathur in Arabic comes from the word kathra. Kathra means plenty. Like kathir means a lot. Kathir means a lot, right? So kathra, plentifulness. Allah Azza wa Jalla in takathur in tafa'ul it means three things. I'd like you to at least actually four things, and I'm going to go through all four of those meanings before we establish the full meaning of the ayah, inshaAllah. The first thing takathur means is the desire of having a lot. Kathir itself means a lot. At takathur, the desire to have a lot. So the first meaning is the desire to have a lot distracted you. That's the first meaning. The desire to get a lot distracted you. You were so busy wondering, I don't have enough, I need to get more. I only have a rental, I need to buy a house. I only have an old car, I need to get a newer car. I only have this much savings, I need more savings. I only have one business, I need to establish another business. I only have this, I need more. There's always this desire of getting more and more and more. Your mind was always busy doing that, and it distracted your mind from thinking about something that was more important. That's the first meaning. The second meaning of takathur is the, com- the competing in getting a lot. So the first thing was wanting a lot for yourself. The second is competing with others in getting a lot. How come that guy got more than I did? How come he has more than I do? Man, this guy got a better job. I need to compete. I need to keep up. And you know, this happens at the level of an individual. It happens at work. It could be in petty things. It could be like, man, you're, you know, you're sitting in your cubicle in your office and you got a chair. And the guy next to you got a nicer chair. And you're like... Why did he get a nicer chair? Why did he get that? It's a silly thing, but you're like, you're wondering why, you know, he's a nicer mouse. His mouse pad is cleaner. He gets the window, he gets the window office. I don't get the window office. This could be something so petty, there are two janitors. Two janitors, they, they, their job is to clean up the building. And one of them has a shinier mop, and the other one is saying, man, his mop is nicer than mine. It, this, this, this urge to compete with others in what you have. Constantly comparing your car with somebody else's car. Your house with somebody else's house. Your clothes with somebody else's clothes. Your assets, your, your wealth with somebody else's wealth. So this distracts you. The first thing was you want it for yourself. The second is you're competing with others. This attitude of competition between you, it keeps you, it keeps you busy. By the way, this attitude even takes place in social issues. They had a wedding. So how, how should our wedding, our family's wedding be better than theirs? 
They booked that hall, we should be, book a more expensive hall. They ruined themselves by going into debt, we should ruin ourselves even more by going into deeper debt. <laughs> right? But the idea is this competition. It's always there, it's always there. And of course, this even happens in the workplace among non-Muslims too. It's not just Muslims, of course. Allah is talking to all humanity here. Cutthroat. Who wants to get the promotion? Man, that guy better not get it. And if he gets it, why did he get it? Why did he not get it? When somebody gets promoted, it's not like you got paid less. You're still, you're still, there's still food on your table. But there's this natural urge inside the human being. It even happens among children. It even happens among children. You know, there, uh, you have two kids. One of them, the teacher gave your kid a star on their paper. And the other teacher didn't give them a star. Right? Because the, she gives stars on some other things. So this one kid, you're sitting in the car, you're driving home with your kids, the one kid goes, I got a star. And the other one's upset. I didn't get anything. Now the fact is, whether she got a star or not, does that hurt this first child? No. But be, what is inside already embedded? This urge of competition. I want to get everything he or she gets. I want everything they have. This is a natural tendency. And Allah Azza wa alludes to that tendency in this ayah. So the first thing was wanting more, and the second was competing in more. That's the second meaning. Here's the third meaning. It is taking pride in having more. At-tafakhur ma'ad takathur. To take pride in the fact that you have more. In other words, when somebody comes to you, and they're just talking about whatever, you make it a point to let them know, yeah, I graduated from that school. And, you know. and by the way, this car, I just got it two months ago. Got a really good deal. Only 37,000, etc. They didn't ask you about your car. They didn't ask you. But you felt an urge to tell them anyway, because takathur implies, not only do you have it, you like to tell people you have it. You like to let them know, yeah, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I got this and that and the other. Right? So th- these three things so far, right? And then there's the fourth. Tafa'ul in Arabic, it has two things in it. It has mufa'ala in it, which means people competing against each other. We covered that one. But the fourth thing the word takathur has is something that is shared. Ta'awun. Competition. Not just competition, but cooperation among each other. Right? When you ha- th- what this fourth meaning is, is all of you have the same thing. All of you share the desire of wanting more. There is not one of you that wants less. Every one of you wants more. You all, ha- all of you have that in common. And this common urge to want more and more and more, and to compete with each other, this one thing that has united all of you, by the way, this is one thing that unites people that are even different in religion, race, ethnicity, age. You could be different in so many ways, right? But what is, what is one thing all people have in common? They want more. They want more than what they have. Nobody's happy with what they, what they have already. And Allah says, this sentiment, this attitude, it deluded you. It distracted you. But you know in Arabic, when this verb is used, ilha, then you're supposed to also add, distracted from what? The question is, okay, I got distracted. When you say, I got distracted, you're supposed to add, I got distracted from what? I got distracted from work, I got distracted from school, I got distracted from what? And when you do that in Arabic, you add the word an. Like the ayah I shared with you, لا تلهكم أموالكم ولا أولادكم Then Allah adds, an ذكر الله Don't allow your monies and your children to distract you from what? From the remembrance of Allah. There's a from there, there's an additional information, there's a piece of information that you're expecting. Now in this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal did not mention عن أي شيء عن what? Or in regards to what are we distracted? So now, by leaving it open, by leaving it open, the benefit of that is, it becomes itlaq. It becomes absolute. You figure it out. Allah wants you to figure out, what is it that you're distracted from? Some of the ulama commented, the first thing, it distracted you from the truth. It distracted you from the one calling you to the truth. He's calling you to something important. Yeah, I'm busy with work, man. Somebody comes to you, hey, listen, why don't we learn something about Qur'an? Why don't we learn something about the sunnah of our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I'm busy right now. And Allah is saying, your busyness is actually a distraction. And it kept you from the truth. It kept you away from it. This is one thing, keeping away from the truth. From looking within yourself. Another commentary from ulama we find in tafsir. That al-muhasaba, it distracted you from looking inside. What am I doing with my life? Why am I running after this stuff? And you know, when you run after stuff, what happens when you get it? You get bored of it. 
Then you go run after something else. Then you get bored of that too. Then you go run after something else. Happens to all of us. If you're running after buying a home, once you buy the home, what happens? After a while, somebody else's home starts looking a little nicer than yours. Right? It just gets boring. You gotta redecorate it. You get bored. When you, your kids really, really wanna, want you to buy a video game for them, you buy it for them. How long did it before they get bored of it? A couple of days, they beat the game and that's it. It's finished. A new movie is coming out. You know, back when I was in New York, I always talk about this. When I was coming out, I think it was the Star Wars. That, like, one of them came out in the 70s and then another sequel came out. I don't know how many there are now. But one came out, it was a big buzz in New York, right? And there was open, only opening in this one movie theater. And there was a line longer than the line for the passport for Hajj. These guys are waiting to get their ticket to see that movie all night. They're standing in Qiyam waiting to get the movie ticket, right? They want nothing more in life than to watch that movie. Some of them are even dressed in ihram. <laughs> They're dressed in the Star Wars gear, painting their faces, Jedi Knights, the works, right? Because they want to go see this movie. Once they go see this, they wanted nothing more. If you talk to them right then and there, you say, you want to come and do some work or you want to do something else? No, 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 no. This is what I want to do. Once they finish watching the movie, what do they come out and say? Ah, it could have been better. It wasn't that good. The special effects were kind of cheesy. This and that. You just wanted this so badly. And what happened? You got deluded. You thought this is going to bring you happiness. That's why you did it. But as soon as you were done, were you happy at the end? No. You figured something else. Man, I can't wait till the third one comes out. Now you moved on to the next thing. So you keep deluding yourself. You never stop and think, man, I'm never satisfied. Every time I get one, I want something else. Every, every time I get this, I want that. I, I, never get, I never get fulfilled. I never get content. So it even kept you from looking within yourself. It kept you from pondering over your purpose in life. This distraction, this want, this competition, it kept you from pondering, why am I here? Is my job on this earth only to run after things, and then run after some other things, and then run after some other things, and then go into my grave? Is that, is that why I was here? Is that what I was put here for? Because that's what animals do. They eat, then they get hungry again, then they go eat, and they get hungry again, and they go... So what's the difference between me and an animal? If this is what all I'm here for, then how am I any different from an animal? But this, you were so busy in this competition, you never had time to think about that even for yourself. Even if you did, it a fleeting thought. Never something that you would truly ponder over. Then of course, ulama comment, it kept you from paying attention to this message, to this Qur'an. This Qur'an was supposed to open your eyes. It was supposed to show you what your purpose in life is. It was supposed to give you the best introspection, look inside your own consciousness for you. It opens yourself up to you. But you didn't have time for this Qur'an because you're too busy with takathur, it's deluding you. But the most interesting commentary I found is, you remember what the last surah was? So al Qari'ah, al Qari'ah, The loud knocking noise from the beginning. Hawiyah at the end, hellfire. Allah says, Alhaakum takathur This distraction was so huge, it even kept you from al Qari'ah. It even distracted you from the fact that the entire earth will be rattled. That hellfire will be brought forth. And some people's scales will be heavy, and some people's scales will be light. That huge reality that you learned about, that you memorize, that you even recite. Many of us recite that surah, because it's short and we're in a hurry, right? So we recite it. And yet, even though we recite it, we're distracted from that reality. How can that be? Al-Hakum al SubhanAllah. That's Allah's commentary in the beginning. Let's look at some of the things that ulama have said in regards to this ayah. First, we'll look at the parallel between this and Surah Al-Adiyat. Remember, Al-Adiyat talked about attitudes in dunya and this surah also. In that surah, Allah Azza wa says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَ نُودٍ No doubt the human being is very disloyal, ungrateful to his master. وَإِنَّهُ عَلَى ذَلِكَ لَشَهِيدٍ And no doubt he is a witness to that truth. وَإِنَّهُ لِحُبِّ الْخَيْرِ لَشَدِيدٍ There is no doubt his love of good, his love of stuff, things in dunya is very intense. And now Allah is saying, your love is so intense, that he said in that surah. In this surah he's saying, your love of those things is so intense, it ends up doing what? Distracting you. So it's the next step. What did that love end up doing? It ended up distracting you. There's a solid connection between the two things. Alha Zamakhshari comments, Ida shagalahu. Meaning, this plentiness or this desire, it kept you busy. Not only in your mind, but even in your activities, it kept you busy. He defines the kathar as, as following, At-tabari fil kathra, wa tabahi biha, to show off in plentiness and to be proud of it in and of yourself. Wa an yaqul ha'ulai nahnu akthar, wa ha'ulai nahnu akthar. And so that some of them would say, we have more. And the other would say, no, 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 we have more. And that's what your entire life would be spent. Just saying who has more and who has less. 
Subhanallah. At Takathur commented again by uh, Ash Shawkani rahimahullah, Tafakhuru ayyuhum ayyuhum akthar adadan. That they show off to one another who has more in terms of what. And then he says, "O arada al hakum al takathur bil amwal wal aulad ila al muttum wa qubirtum." Very important comment. He said the distractions it may perhaps are distractions of money and children. The distractions that Allah is talking about takathur is two things: money and children. Why is he saying that? When ilha is mentioned elsewhere, what does Allah say? La tulhikum amwalukum wa la auladukum. With the verb, the, the verb for distraction associated in the Quran is with wealth, assets, and children. That's one place. Another th- place is takathur. So in Surah Al-Hadith, he says, وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ So with the first word of the ayah, ilha, we also find amwal and awlad. With the second word, takathur, in the Quran, we also find amwal and awlad. We find both things. So both amwal, meaning assets and children, we want more and more and more for them or of them. And on the same time, at the same time, both of them are incredible distractions from our real purpose in life. They can become enormous distractions. One slight comment that should be used to clarify, when it says, takathur fil awlad, plentiness in terms of children, it means a few things. It doesn't just mean having lots of children. Plentiness in terms of having lots of children. Of course, we're living in times where people don't want to have a lot of kids. It's bad for the economy. Right? And there are even some countries in the world where there's a policy, you can't have a certain, more than a certain number of kids. And you know, they try to play with the order of Allah, and then it come back, comes back to haunt them. Why didn't they want to have more children? They didn't want to have more children because they can't afford it, the economy won't support it. And what ended up, ended up happening now, in places like China, now there's a new economic crisis. We don't have enough of a workforce to handle the, the infrastructure demands of our country because we curbed the population. <laughs> So there is a new economic catastrophe now that they themselves created because of curbing population. Subhanallah. <laughs> Subhanallah. So you have both, you know, the order of Allah Azza wa Anyway, the second me- meaning that is not often caught is when Allah says, takathurun fil amwal, it means, or fil awlad, it means you want more for your children. In other words, you know this competition, I should have more than the other? It transcends into your children. You say, my kid should have more than the other guy's kid. My kid should make it to the team. Why did he get picked? Why did that one get an A and my, mine got a B? I'm going to go complain to the teacher. How come his son got a B? Why has nothing to do with your son? You, your son got a C for his own reasons. That has nothing to do with him. But you're always comparing yours to someone else's. Yours to someone else's. So th- this becomes petty, not just for you, but even for your children. So, Allah Azza wa says, Actually, before we go to what Allah says in the next ayah, let's look at a few more comments. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu had an interesting reading of this ayah. He, he used to add an extra hamza in the beginning. Al-hakum takathur Or al-hakum takathur You know what that means? Did this, this urge of plentiness, this competition of plentiness, was this what distracted you? Is that what kept you busy? So it's actually he reads it in the form of a question. He reads this ayah in the form of a question. And you know when you're yelling at someone, sometimes you yell at them in the form of a question. Is that what I taught you? Is that what you just did? Now you don't say, you just did it. You say, is that what you did? Can, can you explain to me why you did that or how you did that? So you put it in the form of a question because it's part of zajr, yelling at someone, scolding them. So Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala who has that reading of the ayah. Abu Muslim finally, actually we already covered his comment. His comment was basically that it could be a shared sentiment among people. Okay, so we'll uh, glaze that over inshallah. One last place we'll look at in the Qur'an in regards to the first ayah, which is uh, in Surah Al-Kahf, which is a good explanation of Al-Hakum al takathur You know the story of the two farmers? One of them had a small garden, the other one had a much better off garden. How did he show takathur? He says to the poorer farmer, the, the wealthier one says to the poorer one, he says, أَنَا أَكْثَرُ مِنْكَ مَالًا وَأَعَزُّ نَفَرًا I am more than you in terms of wealth. And I am more powerful in terms of manpower. I have a lot more sons that take care of my business. You're a loner. You don't have anybody helping you out. So he says, he established this, أَنَا نَحْنُ أَكْثَرُ And the other one says, نَحْنُ أَكْثَرُ So he was showing this takathur to the other. All right. So this, this, uh, uh, a few things. Actually, I, I did say that was the last comment, but I should mention this comment. This is important, inshallah. This is in regards to the fact that Allah said it distracted you, but didn't mention what is it that distracted you. This is the commentary of Ash-Shawkani, rahimahullah. He says, 
وَلَمْ يَقُلْ عَنْ كَذَا He didn't say it distracted in regards to wall. What? بَلْ أَطْلَقَهُ Rather he made it absolute. لِأَنَّ الْإِطْلَاقَ أَبْلَغُ فِي الذم, Because making it absolute is more eloquent when it comes to reprimand, when it comes to, to yelling at someone or to, to criticize them. لِأَنَّهُ يَذْهَبُ الْوَهْمْ فِيهِ كُلَّ مَذْهَبْ فَيَدْخُلُ فِيهِ جَمِيعُ مَا يَحْتَمِلُهُ الْمَقَامِ He says by leaving it open, there are all these doors of what distract, what were you distracted from are opened up to you. Remember we talked about your purpose in life, pondering over yourself. All these things that were you were distracted from. So all these doors are open to you. وَلِأَنَّ الْحَذْفَ الْمُتَعَلَّقْ مُشْحَرْ بِالتَّعْمِيمِ And by making it removed, it's known now that it's general. Meaning it's not reduced to one distraction, it is many distra- many things that you should have paid attention to. None of them you paid attention to because of these things. So that's one another benefit. كَمَا تَقَرَّرَ فِي عِلْمِ الْبَيَانِ as is established in the science of eloquence, this is a science within Arabic rhetoric, you study when something is not mentioned, what's the benefit of that? وَالْمَعْنَى أَنَّهُ شَغَلَكُمُ التَّكَاثُرْ عَنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And the meaning is that it, this takathur kept you busy from everything. يَجِبُ عَلَيْكُمُ الْاشْتِغَالِ بِهِ That demanded that you should be busy with them instead. مِنْ طَاعَةِ اللَّهِ from the, Of course, from the obedience to Allah وَالْعَمَلْ لِلْآخِرَةِ and for working towards the Akhirah. These were the things that you should have been busy with and it kept you away from them. So this was the last comment we had on the first ayah. Allah says, حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرِ Zara is to go meet someone. Ziyara is to go meet someone. You know Urdu people say ziyarat karna, right? Similar word, to go meet someone. But actually in ancient Arabic it has a, another meaning. It's actually to go and hug someone too. To, 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 for your chest to meet, this is also called ziyara. Meaning you don't just go meet someone and wave at them, you go and give them a hug. Okay? And Allah uses this, and by the way, when you meet someone, is it permanent or temporary? It's temporary, you leave it eventually. So it has that meaning too. It's not just you moved in with someone, you visited them, meaning you left afterwards. Allah uses this word, حَتَّى زُرْتُمْ الْمَقَابِرِ Until you met with, or you came to greet the grave. Literal meaning, until you came to greet the graves. In other words, you know when you meet someone, you're looking forward to them? And you're, you know, you're preparing for it? Whether you like it or not, you have to go meet. And who's the one you're going to visit? Your grave. By using ziyara with maqabir, one of the lessons we learned here is, we're not going to be our gra- in our graves forever. Because a visit is not for ever. Allah doesn't use ziyara for jannah, or jahannam, but He uses ziyara for maqabir, for, for graves. But if you look at the, the other surah, the other surah which talked about the attitudes in dunya, Surah Al-Adiyat, أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُ إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُبُورِ Does any know? Does any know about the time when everything in the graves will be turned over? But the word used there was kubur. And the word used here is maqabir. Maqabir. Maqabir is the word more appropriate with ziyara. Because ziyara is done to a place, and maqabir is the plural of maqbara. Every, and a noun in Arabic, an ism in Arabic, when it begins with ma, ma, it is dharf makan. It can be alluding to a place like masjid, right? Or matar, airport, or maqad, place to sit, majlis, a place to sit also, a gathering. So the ma in the beginning illustrates a place, dharf makan. And a visit is done to a place. So the word used for the grave is alluding to the fact that it's a place, meaning like the graveyard and places like that. You always, when you're busy with gaining plenty, what's the one place you don't go visit? The gra- it has nothing for you. The graveyard has no worldly benefit for you. So you go and visit the mall, the workplace, family, investors. You go everywhere else. Where don't you go? You don't go visit the graves. And this b- biggest example personally for me was in New York City. You know, I used to live in New York City. Uh, I used to live in Queens and I, my college was in Manhattan. So we're driving on the LIE and you pass by this massive graveyard over the highway. And I must have passed it 10 straight years. Never went there. Right? Never went. And when do pe- and people, I'm not the only one, millions upon millions of people pass by that graveyard every single day. Nobody ever goes there except when? <laughs> when, when they're being transferred. When they're moving in. Right? SubhanAllah. So this is one meaning of the ayah. But the other meaning is also very, very interesting. We find a sabab in nuzul. You know, some ayat have historical context and how it was understood at that time. Some uh, commented that there were tribes among the people who used to show off to one another in everything. We have more people than you do. We have more weapons than you do. Our dead are better than your dead. 
We have, and they used to go to the graveyard and say, we used to have that guy, and that guy, and that guy. Do you have anyone like that that ever lived in your tribe? So they used to point at the graves and say, compete with each other and say, do you have the likes of this and this and this? Have you ever had those? It's kind of similar nowadays to saying, we in our history had this general, and that one, and that one, and that one. Taking pride in heroes of the past. But they would do it more literally, actually go to the graveyard, point at his grave and say, do you have a guy like, you know, can you compete, compete with that one? How about that one? How about that one? Again, in a more sophisticated sense, it happens nowadays when we compete with, or, or, or show off our historical figures. Of course, Muslims refer to like, you know, Salah al-Din, or they refer to the Sahaba. And we talk about our historical figures, and we take pride in them. Who's got the likes of those people? You know what I'm saying? Now, by doing this, and the irony that Allah is establishing is one hatta zurtum al maqabir means hatta yatikum al maut. Fakubirtum until death came to you and you were in your graves. You kept competing in plentiness until you went to the to your own graves. But the other meaning is you used to go to the graves, and when you go to the grave, what should happen? What should happen is you should remember where you're headed. But you even used to go to the grave to show off against each other. So even the grave that is supposed to be the easiest place for you to remember your purpose in life. You know, if you're not a very spiritual person, and you don't think about the akhirah a lot, if, if you haven't prayed for years and years and years, if you go for a burial, and you've never gone to a burial, if you go to a burial after a janazah, you follow the, the procession and you go to the burial. If you go that, that will be a spiritual experience for you. Just walking around and leaving, uh, reading the gravestones, Reading this guy died at the age of, or this child died at the age of 20, this one at the age of 6 months, this one at the age of 83 years, this one at the age of 31, this one was this, this one, this guy was my age, this woman, this man, this woman, and you will read that, and you, know what, you won't be thinking of them, who will you be thinking of? Yourself. It's gonna open up your eyes. The graveyard is a great place to open up your eyes, to remember where we're, we're all headed. It's a place of silence and reflection. And yet you people, you even turned the graveyard into a place of takathur. You, you couldn't even get a lesson from that. You people are hopeless. Which is why the past tense in the beginning is appropriate. Alha. It deluded you. Not that it will delude you, but it already deluded you. In other words, you are beyond hope. You people are a hopeless case. If it says it will delude you, there's still hope. Maybe it won't. Maybe I'll change because it has that potential. But if it's already happened, it means you people are a hopeless case. SubhanAllah. Now, and specifically this comment, I, I, there are many Mufassirun that have said this, but we'll just quote Shawkani, inshaAllah ta'ala, وَقِيلْ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا يَزُورُنَ الْمَقَابِرِ It's said that they used to visit these graves, فَيَقُولُنَ هَذَا قَبْرُ فُلَانٍ وَهَذَا قَبْرُ فُلَانٍ فَيَفْتَخِرُونَ بِذَلِكِ And they used to say, this is the grave of that great one, this is the grave of that great one, they used to take pride in saying that. كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Identical ayat, except for what? ثم in the beginning. The rough meaning, kalla. First, let's look at the word kalla. Bima'na haqqan. Kalla means for sure. Kalla literally means not at all. No way. No way. In other words, this delusion of yours is not gonna last. No way. You're gonna wake up soon. And you, uh, and when you do wake up, you will yourself be saying, what have, what, what have I done? How, can I, how could I have been deluded? You know when people are so distracted, there are people you try to wake up and you try to tell them what, the, what life is all about and they don't want to hear it at all. And you say to yourself, man, there's no way this guy will ever, ever accept the truth. That guy is a hopeless case. This one, no way they will ever listen. Allah says to them, kalla. No, there is a time. For sure. They will listen. No more distractions. And this is after they've gone to the graves, right? After they've been buried. Now, kalla sawfa ta'alamun, the first one. Very, very soon you will find out. Sa ta'alamun means soon you will find out. Sawfa ta'alamun, very soon you will find out. Meaning your death is very, very close. It's not just close, it's very close. And as soon as you die, you're gonna find out. Ali radiallahu anhu used to say, annasu niyam. People are sleeping. He says, people are sleeping. And when they die, they wake up. They die, they wake up. This, is, this was his comment, radiallahu anhu, in regards to this ayah. So we find, كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَبُونَ Soon you will find out. Find out when? You'll find out when you go to your grave. Man, what have I been busy with? What should I have been busy with? You'll find that out pretty soon. As soon as one goes into the grave and the questioning begins, you realize how messed up you have been. That's the first one. Then he says, ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَبُونَ Then again, 
ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Some ulama comment, the second ayah is not just for emphasis, the first one is for the questioning in the grave, when you will realize how messed up you were. The second one, soon you will find out, is when you come out of the grave, when the day of judgment begins, and all of your deeds are taken out, and the whole scrolls begin, then you will really realize how distracted you had been. The full record. And the second record is more comprehensive than the first record. In the, in the grave you're questioned, but not thoroughly. But when you come out on the day of judgment, how are you questioned? Thoroughly. So the second questioning is more powerful than the first, which is why the second ayah has thumma, making it more powerful. Thumma is akad. It, it adds tafkhim, it adds tahweel, it adds emphasis, it adds terror, and it adds, adds uh, comprehensiveness to the phrase. So, Allah Azza wa Jal says, كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Zamakhshiri has an interesting comment. He says, إِنْ ذَارٌ لِيَخَافُوا فَيَنْتَبِهُ مِنْ غَفْلَتِهِمْ This is a gift from Allah. This is a warning. So that they may wake up from their delusion and their distraction. وَالتَّكْرِيرُ تَأْكِيدٌ لِلْرَدْعُ وَالْإِنْذَارُ عَلَيْهِمْ And this rep- repetition, the benefit of it is that when you repeat, the warning becomes stronger. I'm telling you, I'm telling you. When you do that twice, what happens? The one listening is really warned. You know, you, if you really want to stop your, your kids running into the parking lot, stop, stop, stop. You don't say it once. How many times do you say it? You repeat it? The more serious the warning, naturally, what do you do? You repeat it. You're gonna find out. You're gonna find out. كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ the repetition of it actually adds to the state of urgency and the, the style of warning that Allah Azza wa Jalla is, is uh, communicating. وَالْأَوَّلْ أَشَدْ and, and you know, this, this style is used in Arabic, for example, أَقُولُ لَكُ ثُمَّ أَقُولُ I'm telling you. Man, I'm telling you. You say it again. You know, and you say this twice to get the point across to someone who does, apparently, until you say it to them this way, it won't affect them. It won't, be, they're beyond the point of just casually talking to them and they're ready to reason. So you have to give them the stronger language. The Qur'an, you know, the problem is, for us, the Qur'an is in the form of book. We're reading it. But when the Qur'an was being recited to the kuffar, it wasn't being recited in the form of book. How was it being presented? Speech. And in a speech, you can emotionally affect your audience. But in writing, it's not as easy to do that. In speech it is. Which is why even today, if you're reading Qur'an, you may not be moved. But if you're listening to Qur'an in salah, what might happen? You'll be moved. Because the, the real effect is in speech. The real effect, heart to heart, is in speech. Somebody emails you advice, eh, I don't know. Somebody gives you advice over the, over the phone, you take it a lot more seriously. Because words, when you hear them, they just have a more, they, they are closer to the heart. Which is why even in the Qur'an, we don't find the Sahaba saying, قَرَأْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We read and we obeyed. What did they say? سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا We heard and we obeyed. Spe- writing is read, but speech is what? Heard. And it's so compelling that once we hear it, we're ready to obey. It's powerful speech. So this is one of the, one of the benefits of having dars al-Qur'an. Right? Lectures on the Qur'an. Inshallah, better and, and, and more qualified scholars will do them and more of them. One of the benefits of that is it revives a sunnah of the Qur'an itself. The, sun, the Qur'an first and foremost isn't meant to be read. The Qur'an first and foremost is meant to be heard. The Messenger ﷺ recites it onto the people so they can hear it. يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ And part of its power and its emotional strength is lost when you reduce it to reading. When it's not something that is heard. كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ No, not at all. Had you only had. لَوْ is كَلِمَةَ الْحَصْرِ It's a word used to express um, what's called uh, regret. So Allah Azza wa Jalla is expressing regret on their behalf and saying, if you only knew. If you only had knowledge. What kind of knowledge? He says, ilm al yaqeen If you had knowledge of certainty. Had you known the knowledge of certainty? There's ilm al yaqeen A few ayat later, we'll find something else. We'll find ayn al yaqeen Okay? ثُمَّ لَتَرَوَنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ So there's two now. There's the knowledge of certainty. There's the eye of certainty. These are figures of speech. We'll talk about each of them inshaAllah ta'ala. Then in the Qur'an, there's a third one. Which occurs twice. Allah Azza wa Jalla uses the word حَقُّ الْيَقِينَ وَإِنَّهُ لَحَقُّ الْيَقِينَ So there's عِلْمُ الْيَقِينَ عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ and حَقُّ الْيَقِينَ There are three of them. If one has to understand all three and their relationship between them before we understand these ayat properly. So let's do that inshaAllah ta'ala. First of all, let's look at the word يَقِينَ itself. That's the common denominator between these three phrases. 
Two of these phrases once again are in this surah. Which two phrases? Ilm al yaqeen and Ain al yaqeen. And the other, the third phrase doesn't occur in this surah, it occurs elsewhere twice. And this is Haqq al yaqeen. Haqq al yaqeen. Okay? So let's first again, let's look at the meaning of the word yaqeen. Imam Raghib says, Al yaqeen min sifat al ilm fawq al ma'rifa aw al diraya. He says, yaqeen is a, a kind of knowledge that is above just being familiar with something or having information about something. It is a higher form of knowledge. That's the first attribute. So it's more than just knowing, having yaqeen. I'd like to translate the word yaqeen with the words solid conviction or unflinching conviction. You're absolutely, absolutely, absolutely convinced of something, then you use the word yaqeen. This is even stronger than iman by the way. This is, and we'll see why it's even stronger than iman when it's used. Then we find Abu Hilal al Askari commenting on the word yaqeen. He says, Al yaqeen sukunu nafs wa nahju sadr bima alima. This is very important. Two parts. He says, yaqeen is something you are so convinced of that deep inside you are satisfied with it. You're okay with what it says. You know, there's one thing somebody says there's an afterlife, and you say, yeah, I guess it makes sense. I guess it's possible. Right? Okay, I'm willing to accept that. That's not yaqeen. That's a casual acceptance. But you say for sure, for sure, as sure as yesterday, as sure as you are sitting before me, that certain that there is an akhirah, now this becomes yaqeen. And I'm sad in my heart, this is not just a casual thing, it's become firm. This is the first attribute of yaqeen. The second, وَنَهْجُ sadr مِمَا amila. So one, you're, you're not... Actually, this was the second. The first is sukun nafs which is... You don't think about it again. It's not something you revisit. It's done. It's an absolute reality. It's a premise which you don't go back and revisit again. Okay? So these are the two attributes. So you're, it's, it's something you don't revisit. And second, you're completely internally satisfied and have uh, internalized that reality. So, how is the word yaqeen used in the Qur'an? We find the word yaqeen being used to talk about death. Hatta atana al-yaqeen. Wa'bud rabbaka hatta ya'tiyaka al-yaqeen. The word yaqeen is used in place of maut. Why? Even the kafir for sure believes in what? Death. Death. You, you, you know, no matter if he, you could disbelieve in akhirah, you can disbelieve in the questioning of the grave, you could disbelieve in paradise and hellfire, fine. No one in their right mind will disbelieve in death. That is the absolute certainty. That's the starting point for any discussion. For anyone, they would, they would know. What is the certainty? In our future, what's one thing for sure? It's death. That's for sure. So it's so certain for everyone that Allah uses the word yaqeen for it. He uses the word yaqeen for it. Now we find in the Qur'an this idea of, you know, you accept it, it makes sense to you, but you don't want to really let it internalize inside. We find this concept in the Qur'an too. We find, قُلْتُمْ مَا تَدْرِيمَ السَّاعَةَ إِنَّ ظُنُّ إِنَّ إِلَّا ظَنًّا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُسْتَيْقِنِينَ When you tell them about the hour, they say, yeah, we've thought about it. Nothing more than a thought though. We think it's a good idea. But we're not thoroughly convinced. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمُسْتَيْقِنِينَ We're not ready to accept it deep down inside. Casually, it's an interesting concept, sir. It's a very interesting theology you Muslims have. That's as far as you'll go. But you're not going to accept it as istiqan. You're not going to let it get deep inside of you. So this is, this is the, the, uh, the tragedy of the one who doesn't have yaqeen. Now the difference between ilm al-yaqeen, ayn al-yaqeen, and haqq al-yaqeen. I'll give you, I'll explain this to you by means of example. If you're driving and you see smoke, you don't see the fire, you only see what? Smoke. You conclude based on the smoke that there must be a what? There must be a fire. But did you see the fire? No. You based on your knowledge, assume because there is smoke, smoke must come from a fire. You didn't see it with your own eyes, but it is based on knowledge still, this is called ilm al-yaqeen. The certainty that is based on what? On knowledge. On knowledge. You don't have to have seen it, it is because of your knowledge that you led, it led you to that conclusion. This is a pretty viable means of deriving conclusions. You see smoke, there must be fire. You see, you see uh, for example, wet ground, you come outside and you see the whole, the whole parking lot is soaked. Or the whole yard is soaked. Must have been rain. It must have rained while I was sleeping. You can derive that conclusion based on what you see. Did you see the rain yourself? No. But this is what kind of yaqeen? What kind of conviction? Ilm al yaqeen. If you go close and see the fire yourself, now you see the smoke and you see what? The fire. 
Now what kind of yaqeen is this? Ayn al yaqeen. You saw it with your own eyes. So your conviction is not based only on knowledge, it is based on what you have seen with your own eyes. But then you go close and you say, maybe that's a trick. And you go and you touch the fire. And you felt the flame. You felt the burn. When you, or you got close to the fire and you felt the heat. When you felt it, you know what that is? That is haqq al yaqeen. Three degrees. Now it's absolutely, the, the, the truth of it has manifest upon you in some way, that is haqq al yaqeen. In this dunya, Allah is offering us two of these. He is offering us ilm al yaqeen. In himself, in the akhirah, ilm al yaqeen. That's one. How is he offering us ilm al yaqeen? You see this creation? Like you see the smoke? Smoke comes from fire, right? You see the creation? The question comes what? Where did this come from? Where did this come from? It's all pointing to who? Allah. Do you get to see Allah in al yaqeen? No. You don't get to see Him. But can you still have ilm al yaqeen? Knowledge of certainty? Absolutely. This word, this Quran, this perfection of this book. How can this be the word of a human being? What kind of knowledge is this? What kind of conviction do you get from it? Ilm al yaqeen. This is the first. Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Kalla lau ta'lamuna ilm al yaqeen." Had you only known the knowledge of certainty, in other words, had you only known revelation, if you studied this revelation, you would have become certain that there is an akhirah. You would have become certain that there is someone that created you that will question you. You would have become certain that he is the messenger of Allah. The only thing you needed was this knowledge that I given, I've given you. You know, Allah says in the Quran, "Al Rahmanu Allama al Quran." He taught the Quran. And by the way, describing the Qur'an, Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَإِنَّهُ لَحَقُّ الْيَقِينَ We'll come to that third one now. This feeling of the flame. That is also something in dunya. عِلْمُ الْيَقِينَ You can skip عَيْنُ الْيَقِينَ and go straight to what? حَقُّ الْيَقِينَ You can skip عِلْمُ الْيَقِينَ How? If you really, you know, there's one thing to study Islam and be convinced of it based on evidences. Research. Right? But then there is something that hits you deep inside your heart that tells you this wallahi is the truth. This is a state of ihsan that Allah Azza wa Jal, his, his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa describes in Hadith Jibreel. He says, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ وَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ If you don't, if you, you enslave yourselves to Allah as though he can, you could see Him. And if you can't, at least know that He can see you. This has to do with seeing. But is there any real seeing going on? No, but you feel it like it's there. حَقُّ الْيَقِينَ This is absolute certainty. This is used in the Qur'an to describe the Qur'an itself. So if you want to go from Ayn al yaqeen which is intellectual knowledge, to this deeply felt knowledge, then the means to it is Allah's book. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. He describes it in, this, in these terms. Okay. So these are the three kinds of uh, knowledge. The, the, but the, where does it all begin though? Ilm al yaqeen Ilm al yaqeen The problem of the kuffar was, they didn't want Ilm al yaqeen What did they want? Ayn al yaqeen you keep telling me the sun and the moon are gonna run into each other. You keep telling me the oceans will boil. You keep telling me that Jannah and hell, I haven't seen any of this. If I saw it, I would be convinced. Have you ever heard the expression, I'll believe it when I see it? Right? That is what kind of yaqeen? Ayn al yaqeen. That's what they wanted. But Allah says, no, I am giving you what? Ilm al yaqeen. An animal can be convinced with Ayn al yaqeen. But you're a human being. You're a higher level. You should be convinced with what? The knowledge. Knowledge should lead you to conviction. An animal can see a fire and run, but you were created at a higher level. You should, you should demand higher evidence. And knowledge is higher evidence, higher reasoning, subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way he describes this topic. Then we find, let's move on inshaAllah ta'ala. How Allah Azza wa Jalla describes ilm al yaqeen and, and, and uh, how the, the ulama have uh, talked about it. Al yaqeen hun al maut. Qatada says yaqeen here refers to death. As it does in other places. Okay? So knowledge of death, in other words, you would know, how can life just end at death? You would have de- your soul would have demanded an answer beyond just death. And by the way, even people who don't believe in the akhirah, even they want to live after they die. You know how? How I know that for sure? You have these like intellectuals, philosophers, uh, multi-millionaires that don't believe in religion. They think religion is for fools. Okay? That's what they believe. And they, multi-multi-millionaires, and they're about to die. You know what they do? They give their estate, their property, millions of dollars of grants to a university. That's what they do in this country. In many other places, they give these huge grants. But they don't give it when they're young. When do they give it? When they're about to die. Okay? So now at this, the school of medicine, what does it say? So and so and so school of medicine. So and so school, school of architecture. 
They are dying, and what are they hoping? At least my name will live on. That's what they, a, a monument will be built in my name. My name should, my legacy should continue. Even if you deny the akhirah, the afterlife, Allah put a desire inside the human being to go on after he dies. And when you deny the truth of it, it comes out in weird ways like a plaque. That's all you want in the akhirah. I can't have Jannah, so I might as well get a plaque. Right? That's, what they, that's all they get. <laughs> But the idea is it's some, some, some remnant of it. It's rooted in what? The, that, even that idea of giving away and giving after I die, people should remember my charitable work. Why do you want that? You, you don't believe in an akhirah. It's not going to give you any sadaqah or sadaqah jali or anything. It's just that my name, my legacy will continue. I, there's more to me than my death. My, my death, you know, my life will mean something more than just my own lifespan. That's something Allah embedded inside the human being. And the answer to it is the iman in the akhirah. Then he says, لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ For sure you will see al-jahim. Jahim comes from juhum. Juhum is the stare of a lion before it's about to eat you. You know the lion that it looks, stares at its prey and the way it stares, the prey gets petrified, it can't even run anymore because it gets caught in the eyes. Now Allah is talking about a face to face. لَتَرَوُنَّ You will certainly see and you are looking at a flame that is also staring back at you. And he describes this, this thing together. But there are a couple of technical things that are important to mention in this ayah that, are, that may or may not come again. The la in the beginning, which is called lam at-tawqeed, is also used in, in classical Arabic for what's called jawab al-qasm, to respond to an oath. For example, I swear by Allah, la tarawunna al-jahim. So when you say la, there's a qasm, there's an oath understood before it that doesn't even have to be said. But because there's a la here, it's understood that it's there. It's understood that it's, and it could be wallahi, it could be, you know, wal qari'ati, I'm bringing the qari'a as an evidence, it could be anything. But it is there, it is there. And the evidence that is there is the lamb in the beginning. And then the two noons at the end are for sure, for sure. So there are three times the emphasis in this ayah. Lam is one, the first noon is two, and the second noon is three. La tarawunna. La tarawunna. Taraw. Tarawna. Satarawna. You will see. La tarawunna. You will definitely, definitely, definitely see al jahim. You'll have to stare at it face to face. Some ulama commented that this is a reference to all humanity. Like in Surah Maryam, وَإِن مِّنْكُمْ إِلَّا وَارِدُهَا كَانَ عَلَىٰ رَبِّكَ حَتْمًا مَقْضِيًا There is not any one of you except that they will at least pass by it. Warid is to be at the brink of something. Like you know you stop at the bank of a river to get some water, and you move on. Allah says in Surah Maryam, there is not any one of you except that they will at least be at the bank of it, at the bank of it, and then they will go forward. Even the believer will at least see the hellfire before he goes on. Why? He should know what he just escaped. He should have an appreciation of how much trouble he just saved himself from. Right? That's why at least we will get to see it. So some ulama took that and said, this is referring to that. Meaning you will all see it. Other ulama said, no. Because the surah began, al-hakum wa takathur right? worldly life and its distractions and its urge for plentiness deluded you, is that the case of the believer? Is he distracted? No, it's not. So since it's referring to the hopeless case, it's talking about the hopeless case here too. It's talking about the kuffar, who will only see the hellfire. لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ And then when you will see it, ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ And then at that point, thereafter, this is تَتِّيب الْإِخْبَارِ not لَيْسَ تَتِّيب الْزَمَانِيًّا uh, this is not a thumma is not just used to say then after that. It's also used in the meaning of moreover. Here it's more in the sense in the meaning of moreover. This is tartib al ikhbar. Moreover, when you see it at that point, it will be the eye of conviction. Ayn al yaqeen. Meaning you'll be convinced because of what? Knowledge or because you see it? Because you see it. Now, now you're being given knowledge of it and it's not enough for you? Fine. Which kind of knowledge do you want? You want to see it, but when you see it, that's when you get to go in it. If that's the only time you want to believe in it, it's being given to you. But it'll be too late at that point. ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينَ Then you will see it with the eye of conviction. الرُّؤْيَا أَلَّتِي هِيَ نَفْسُ الْيَقِينَ And ثُمَّ مُسْتَأْنِفَ This ثُمَّ is actually cutting itself off from the previous discourse. Then we come quickly to the last ayah insha'Allah ta'ala. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَئِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِينَ Then, now this is Zamani. You'll see it. You'll be thoroughly convinced. Then you will be asked. On that day, yawma idhin. On that day, you will be questioned. In, you will be interrogated thoroughly. Tus aluna, tus aluna with a wow in the middle. You will be asked. 
لَتُسْأَلُونَ is possible, you will definitely be asked. لَتُسْأَلُن is also possible, you will definitely, definitely be asked. Then there is ثُمَّ لَا تُسْأَلُنَّ These are four degrees of emphasis. You are definitely, 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 definitely going to be interrogated. How many times did I say definitely? Four times. Four times. That's how Allah is talking. It's not normal speech. That's not how you normally say something. This is how you talk when you're really mad. I'm definitely gonna get you. Definitely, definitely. You say this over and over again in a state of rage. And this is the rage of Allah Azza wa Jal, and not even in regards to hell. They, Allah didn't even say you're gonna go into hell. He just said you'll see it. He just said tarawnaha. You'll see it. What's the scariest part? It's not even hell. What the scary part is? You'll be asked. That's the scary part. The Messenger of Allah says, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, innahu man su'ila yom al qiyamati faqad halaka. The one who gets questioned even once on the day of judgment has been destroyed. But that's questioned about deeds. Here it's not questioned about deeds. It's questioned about what? عن النعيم In regards to النعيم. Now there's the word na'im comes from the word ni'mah. Ni'mah. Ni'mah means what? Blessing. Blessing. The plural of ni'mah is ni'am or an'um. Allah didn't say ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذٍ عَنِ النِّعَمْ جَمِيعِهَا No. عَنِ الْأَنْعُمْ No. عَنِ النِّعْمَ No, not that either. The specific word used is عَنِ النَّعِيم The word na'im is صِفَة مُشَبَّهَة It has a ya in it. What the benefit of that is, it's a few things. First implication of that is, you yourself were na'im. You will be asked about the fact that you were na'im. Na'im is someone who lives a life of blessings constantly. They are always blessed. They're always getting favors and luxuries being awarded to them. So you will be asked about the fact that you lived a life of luxury. What did you do with all those luxuries that were given to you? Luxury in and of itself is not haram. Having good blessings in this world are not haram. You know there's a, there's a really scary incident in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He's starving. You know, a couple of days of no real food. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq comes over. He looks at his face, he knows he's starving too. Umar bin Khattab comes over. He can tell from his face he hasn't had much to eat either. All, and he, he doesn't worry about himself. Who's he worried about? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Sahaba. So he takes them to another Sahabi who's a little bit more wealthy. And they quickly, and he wasn't home actually. And he said, Salaamu Alaikum a couple of times outside the door. And nobody responded. So once you say, Salaamu Alaikum twice, what are you supposed to do? He's leaving. When he's leaving, the, the, the wife of the Sahabi, the Sahabiya comes out and says, We heard you the first time. We just, want you to do, we just wanted the salam on the messenger, of the messenger to come to our house more than once. <laughs> That's why we didn't answer the first time. So she, so she gives them some food and just a little bit of water, very little bit to eat. And he tells Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he tells Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he tells them, this is the na'im we'll be asked about. This is the blessing. And compare that. And what, they're getting water after a couple of days of dehydration. And what are we in, drinking? And what are we eating? And how are we clothing ourselves? And where are we going to sleep? Imagine. Subhanallah. Our, we're being re, uh, it's being rewired. Our thinking is being rewired. You know when nowadays we've come to a point of confusion in the Muslim ummah. The more dunya you have, you say, Alhamdulillah, I have a really nice house. Which is nice. You should say that. But you should also say, Astaghfirullah, I'll be asked about a really nice house. I'll be asked. The more I have, the more I'll be asked. The less I have, the less I'll be asked. So the one who has more, is nothing wrong with having more, but you better be ready for what? You better be ready to answer. You better be ready, because you, you had more na'im. But you know what modern religious thought became? The more dunya you have, the more Allah loves you. This confusion took over the Christian world and now seeped over into the Muslim world. The Protestants differed from the Catholics in that the Catholics denied worldly pleasure. The Catholics were otherworldly kinds of theology. The Protestants came in and said, no, 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 the Lord wants you to enjoy this world. So even if you listen to a preacher on, the, on a Sunday, which I do sometimes, I don't recommend it. But if you, you listen, you know what they say? The Lord wants you to get a promotion. He wants you to get a nice job. He wants you to get that loan. He wants you to get the new house. He wants you to refinance your money. <laughs> He's telling you the Lord wants you to get more dunya. Because the more you have is a sign, the more the Lord loves you. This is a confusion. This dunya is not a sign of how much Allah loves you or hates you. This dunya is a test. It's a test for the wealthy and it's a test for the poor. The, the wealthiest people in history were some of the worst people. 
Fir'aun was pretty wealthy. Right? And the poorest people, homeless people, Ibrahim alayhi salam was deported. Someone who's been deported, lost his immigration. Right? And he's been made homeless. And he's one of the best human beings that ever lived. Right? And we're not saying that wealth is evil. Wealth is not evil, but it's not good either. It's all a test. And everything that comes to us from Allah is a ni'mah. All of it is a ni'mah. And we will ask, we'll be asked about each and every one of it. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذٍ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ The other meaning of na'im because of the ya in it is a constant blessing. Blessings that you enjoyed consistently. You turned the tap and water just came out. You opened the eyes and the ability to see was there. You didn't have to file an application every time. They were just made available and accessible to you. So you'll be asked about these, these, these instances of na'im. The, the, the way that a shawkani deals with this uh, subject, he says, and the way he ties it together, subhanAllah. عَنِ النَّعِيمِ الدُّنْيَا الَّذِي أَلْهَاكُمْ عَنِ الْعَمَلِ لِلْآخِرَةِ The surah began, تَكَاثُرْ did what to you? It distracted you. What are the things that distracted us? Na'im. The blessings Allah gave us are the ones that distracted us. If we remember that these blessings will be the things that will be questioned, that instead of these blessings becoming a means by which we get distracted, these blessings will become a means by which we stay on track. The blessings of Allah becomes a means to remember Him. To remember and to be grateful to Him. And to remember that we will be answerable for these amanat that Allah has given us. Because in the end, whatever we've been given is not ours. It's His. فَمَا أُوتِيتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَمَتَاعُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Whatever you've been given is worldly utility. And it was given to you, it's not yours. It was, you know when he says, it was given to you? That means it wasn't yours, it was somebody else's, right? It's Allah's, and it was given to you. And it's given to you, it will be also taken away. SubhanAllah. So, ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ In regards to an naim for the believer, uh, another commentary that we find is, it will also be the messenger. It will be the Qur'an. It will be the truth. Isn't that the ultimate blessing in this world? What did you do with that blessing? What did you do with this knowledge? What did you do with the fact that Allah blessed you to say Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? That's not a small gift. What is that? You know, 80% of the world's population doesn't enjoy that gift. But we do. You'll be asked about that too. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ Qatada says, In Allah subhanahu sa'ilun kulla di ni'matin amma an'ama alayhi wa hadha hu al-dahir. He says, No doubt it is Allah who will be the questioner of everyone who possesses any single blessing in regards to whatever he, facilitation he had given to him, and that is truly apparent and obvious. The last thing we're going to read is a narration of Ibn Abi Hatim. This is tying up the whole surah and we'll conclude insha'Allah. Al-Hakum al-Takathur ya'ni an al ta'a uh, the, the, the urge of plentifulness deluded you, meaning it deluded you from obedience to Allah. حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ الْمَقَابِرِ يَقُولْ حَتَّى يَأْتِيكُمُ الْمَوْتِ Until you visited the graves means until death came to you. كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ يَعْنِي لَوْ قَدْ دَخَلْتُمْ قُبُورَكُمْ No, you will soon find out. That's what the ayah says. No, not at all. Soon you're gonna find out. That means... Had you only found out at the time when you will be entering into your graves, ثُمَّ كَلَّا سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ Then again you will find out, لَوْ قَدْ خَرَجْتُمْ مِنْ قُبُورِكُمْ إِلَى مَحْشَرِكُمْ This is at the time, had you known, when you will come out of your graves into the place of your gathering. كَلَّا لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عِلْمَ الْيَقِينَ Had you only had knowledge of certainty, لَوْ قَدْ وَقَفْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْمَالِكُمْ بَيْنَ يَدَيْ رَبِّكُمْ Had you just stopped to think about your deeds that you're doing in the presence of your master? لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ Soon you will see the blazing staring flame. وَذَلِكَ أَنَّ الصِّرَاطِ يُضَحْ وَسَطَ جَهَنَّمِ And this is on the path that leads you and goes through the hellfire. And you, before you get to the paradise, what will you be seeing? All of us will be seeing the jahannam also. Some will fall in it and others will escape. May Allah make us of those who escape. فَنَاجَ مُسْلِمٌ Then the Muslim will escape. وَمَخْدُوشُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ وَمَخْدُوشُ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمَ And he will be warded off from it entirely. ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ يَعْنِي شَعُ الْبُطُونَ You will be asked about all kinds of favor. What does that mean? The, that which fulfilled your stomachs. وَبَارِدُ الشَّرْبِ And cold drink. وَظِلَالُ الْمَسَاكِنَ And the shade of your homes. وَاعْتِدَالُ الْخُلْقِ and the balance of your creation, two working hands, left side, right side, the way we were created in such balanced fashion. وَالْلَذَّةُ النَّوْمَ And the sweetness of, of sleep. <laughs> so, you know, these are the na'im that he talks about. I mean, we don't even think about this stuff as na'im. I was just taking a nap. 
You'll be asked about the nap you took. SubhanAllah. May Allah Azza wa Jal prepare us and make us truly grateful to the blessings that He has bestowed upon us. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who take the lesson, the warning, and apply it to ourselves and to the, our lives and the lives of our families and are able to deliver this message to humanity at large. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.